Brother Boyce's sermon text will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. And Hebrews 6, verse 11. And we desire that every one of you do show the name diligence, the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Great things about speaking to a biblically literate audience is the fact that I make reference to a scripture and the word of God can have free course in your lives and the Holy Spirit can reveal truths to you that I may not be seeing even as the scripture is quoted. Notice that the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 was primarily, I think, to Gentiles. In the 18th chapter of the book of Acts, Paul comes to Corinth. He gets discouraged, and the Lord gives him a vision. You've got a lot of people in that city, but the Jews opposed him, and he shook his garments and said, I'm going to go to the Gentiles, and of all things, he went right next door. And there was the house of Titius Justus. And Crispus, one of the rulers of the synagogue, some synagogues had more than one ruler. Jairus, for example, was one of the rulers of the synagogue. His little girl died and Jesus raised her from the dead. So we have the Jewish synagogue here, and right next door we have a Christian assembly, and I want to talk to you about the contrast. We're talking about sanctification, the, the contrast between the Jewish approach to sanctification and the Christian approach to sanctification. Uh, it's uh, in the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Uh, I love this passage because it kind of delineates what we're talking about, that on the one side was Mount Sinai, and Mount Sinai was associated, according to Hebrews chapter 12, with gloom, <laughs> with a storm, with darkness, with a trumpet blast, and a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged, hey, we don't want to hear it anymore. <laughs> they couldn't bear what was commanded. Even if an animal touched the mountain, it was to be killed. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. The mountain trembled. It was not a happy occasion at Mount Sinai. And as you know, there were 3,000 people who died and they were killed by the Levites, go through the camp, kill every man his neighbor, every man his brother. It was a sad, sad day when the law was given, and that was what was represented by the Jewish synagogue. Uh, can you imagine going into the synagogue service, and I'm sure they didn't have bulletins, but if they did, you know, well, we're going to start with the reading of the Torah. Then we're going to sing the Psalms. Then we're going to have the beatings. <laughs> Jesus warned his disciples, they're going to scourge you in the synagogue. That was a nature. Tell me you the desire to be under the law. Don't you know that Abram had two sons, one by a free woman, one by a slave woman, and these are allegories of two covenants. So over here in the Jewish synagogue, you have people beating and screaming and afraid and filled with gloom. And they got mad at Paul and took him to court. And Sosthenes was one of the other rulers of the synagogue. And he was trying to prosecute Paul. And Gallio, the proconsul, said, I don't want to deal with this. This is your own thing. And so the Jews beat him publicly. <laughs> Are you glad to be delivered from that? You know, no wonder Paul wrote to the Galatians, you foolish Galatian, why would you choose the synagogue when right next door they're saying, the joy of the Lord. 
Lord is my strength. They're loving one another. They're happy. They're glad. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, with They that gladly received his word were baptized. Both the law and the gospel came, I think, on the day of Pentecost. At least the Jewish rabbis felt like the law came 50 days after they had escaped from Egypt and on the on the day of Pentecost, and we do know that when the day of Pentecost fully came, that's when the gospel was started. So we have these Corinthians who were Gentile. Paul said, don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified. Now, in the book of Hebrews, that was, I think, written to people who were children of Abraham physically. And uh, they were to be diligent. The Kadash is the Hebrew word, which is translated, and I guess, in the Septuagint. But the idea is to be separate. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 7, God took his people out of Egypt. And he put them into the promised land where there were seven nations, greater and mightier than they were. But they were not to intermingle or intermarry or have come. They were to be a separate people. And in Deuteronomy chapter 7, maybe I should turn and read this from the text. Deuteronomy chapter 7. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God, the Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other people, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Now, Sadly, it didn't work. God said, you're going to be a separate people. You're going to be the ones through which the Messiah is going to come. But according to Deuteronomy chapter 31, Moses finished writing the book of the words of the law. This is Deuteronomy 31, 24. And from the beginning to end, he gave this command to the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, take the book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. There it will remain as a witness against you. For I know how rebellious and stiff-necked you are. If you have been rebellious against the Lord while I'm alive and with you, how much more will you rebel after I die? Now, we got the synagogue here, and right next door is the church. And both of them are striving for sanctification. Both of them want to be a separate people. Both of them want to be pleasing to God. And I'm saying to you that the Jewish system did not work. In fact, after 1,500 years of law, the people were worse than when the law began. In fact, Jesus said, you come to see and land to make a proselyte. When you make him, he's twofold more the child of hell than you are. There was a degenerating effect, and it was designed by God to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. It wasn't an accident. God knew it wouldn't work. Moses knew it wouldn't work. If there had been no fault <clears throat> with the first covenant, he wouldn't have tried something else. He wouldn't have had a second covenant. So the problem with man is in his heart. Jesus told his disciples, you know, why are you worried about somebody that's eating with unwashed hands? That's not what messes you up spiritually. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. That's the problem is in the heart. And so you'll never be able to be sanctified as you should be. You follow after peace and sanctification without which no man shall see until you have your heart changed. Carol Chessman died in the gas chamber in California, May the 2nd, 1960. My wife and I had just moved 
to California the year before, we were very much into this story. He was a serial rapist, very articulate person. I think he wrote four books while he was in prison. He was on death row almost 12 years, which was a record back then. And just before they put him in the gas chamber to take his life, he said, it seems to me, just as it usually seems to my kind, that society was simply trying to strip or rip off my shield, that it was willing to do so ruthlessly, that it didn't care about me personally or the amount of humiliation or degradation it might inflict in the process, I stubbornly balked at being manipulated, regulated, or compelled to conform blindly through fear or threat of punishment, however severe. Indeed, I came to question the validity of a society that appeared more concerned with imposing its will than inspiring respect. There seemed to me something grossly wrong with this. We will make you be good, I was told. And I told myself, nobody could, would, or should make me do anything, and I proved it. Now, brothers, we know one of these days he's going to bow his knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But do you sense this rebellious attitude? I don't know whether you've made the association or not, but in Numbers chapter 15, there's a story about a man who was gathering sticks on the Sabbath day, and they didn't know what to do with him, put him in war, and the Lord said, just stone him, take him outside the camp, stone him with stones. But right before that, Deuteronomy, uh, Numbers 15, 27, we have a instructions regarding the one who sins unintentionally, verse 27, and the one who sins defiantly, verse 30. And there's a big difference. Word of God discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now, I don't know, God knows, but because these two passages are together, I'm thinking this guy may have had an attitude like Carol Chessman. Yeah, Moses said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, but you can't make me do anything. I'm going to have my way. I don't care what Moses said. I don't care what God said. I don't care. What, I'm going to, you know, this was the original rebellion that Lucifer had said. It's going to be my way uh, or not, you know. So as we're talking about becoming a part of the church on the other side of the wall, you ain't getting in, my friend, if you got a bad attitude. If your intention, you know, uh, Judas Iscariot got up from the feast and went out and not one of the disciples suspicioned what he was going to do. They always going out to give some money to the poor. Oh, maybe he's buying something for the feast. But Jesus knew his intentions. Gee, you didn't have to tell Jesus what was in man. He himself knew what was in man. He looked right through. He in, discerned his the intentions of his heart. He said, "What you do, do quickly." And it had been good for that man if he had never been born. Ananias and Sapphira had bad intentions. It's a serious thing to have bad intentions. When you take the Lord's Supper, you better examine yourself. You better do it because if you don't, you will be eating and drinking damnation to yourself. And for this cause, many were weak and sickly at Corinth, and not a few had died because they partook of the Lord's Supper with evil intentions. Now, 
How are we going to change our hearts? That's the problem. We got the, over here is the old covenant. Unless Carol Chessman said, I don't care how severe the punishment is, you ain't going to change me. I'm going to be my, I'm going to do it my way. And that seems to be the attitude of those people. And that's why Moses, and this is so sad, he said, I'm putting before you life, I'm putting before you death, choose life, and they didn't. He said, I know you're not. That's why God's going to scatter you throughout the whole earth because you're a, you got a bad heart. But praise God, Ezekiel and others predicted, I'm going to take away your heart of stone. I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to put my spirit within you. I'm going to cause you to walk in my way. That's what happens when you give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives you a new, you're, you're a new creation. I used to quote Jeremiah 17, 9 more than, you know, the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked who can know it I don't believe Gene's got a des deceitful and desperately wicked heart I don't I believe God's given you a new heart and I believe he'll give you a new heart now I'm going to quote a poem for all the little children and maybe it will present a message to us older folks too Mary had a little pig and it was white as snow. That is, when it had had a bath, as you, of course, might know. But Mary had an awful time to keep that piggy clean, for he was just the dirtiest pig that one had ever seen. She'd wash him and she'd scrub him till he'd squirm and squeal, as if he wanted her to know it was an unfair deal. And then in the green backyard, he'd play from morning until night, unless he'd happen to slip right out and lose himself from sight. Poor Mary thought and wondered much what she could ever do. And then she figured out a plan, and this she carried through. She took him to a doctor who put the pig to sleep, and then he took his heart right out, but not, of course, to keep. And then he took a little lamb and took his heart out too and put it in the little pig before the piggy knew. And when the piggy did awake, he had no more desire to wallow in the mud again or ever in the mire. So you see, boys and girls, <laughs> we need a new heart too. Just like the little piggy did, the old will never do. I quoted that years ago. And I think it was Mark Gardner, who's now gone to be with you, sitting on the front row, and he said, what happened to the lamb? <laughs> well, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Now, brothers, there's a day and night difference between the synagogue and the church. They, they were similar in many ways, just like Ishmael and Isaac were similar in many ways. But they were radically different. The word radic, radix is a Latin word which means root. At the very root of the law was a carnal commandment. No faith. The law is not of faith. And one reason why it failed to get him into the promised land, according to Hebrews 4, 2, it wasn't mixed with faith. They heard the message, and there was this danger. You're, you're going to get killed. You're going to die. You don't do what we tell you to do. We're going to, you know, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy. Under, that didn't change him. It failed. But over here, praise God, we've got a new heart. <laughs> and if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away, and everything becomes new. One of the illustrations which most of us can understand is family. In Hebrews 2.11, the Bible says, you know, Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren because we have the same father and uh, 
So the Corinthians, boy, of all the congregations, it seemed like they were perhaps the worst as far as their behavior was concerned. And yet throughout the whole book, they are addressed as brethren. Now I've been told my brethren by them which are the household of Chloe that there are contentions among you. This I say that everyone to you, you saith, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Paul, I'm a, you know, but they were brethren, chapter three, brethren. I wanted to feed you with meat. I couldn't do it because you're too infantile. You're, you haven't grown up. Your babies have to, but it's brethren. Chapter five, it was brethren who were dealing with this immoral situation. If any man that's called a brother be immoral, uh, don't eat with, I'm not talking about people in the world. I'm talking about family. I'm talking about brother. Chapter six, brother went to court against brother. Chapter seven, if the unbelieving brother is sanctified by the wife, the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean. Throughout the whole letter, it's brother, 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 brother. There's a difference between the guy with the wedding garment on and the guy that doesn't. There's a difference between my brother, my family member, and somebody else. Now, not all of us were born with Mensa capabilities. Here's a little article about John Mark Stallings. His dad was famous football coach, Crimson Tide, Alabama. Gene Stallings had only one son. He was born with Down syndrome, serious heart problems, didn't think he'd live to be four years old. He lived to be 46. Never learned to count to 10. And yet here are a few of the lasting legacies John Mark Stalling has bequeathed to the world. A best-selling biography honoring his life was written by his daddy. He received an honorary high school diploma from Dallas Christian High School. A Change the World honor from Abilene Christian University. An equipment room was named in his honor at the University of Alabama. Also, a playground there was named in his honor. A football field was named in his honor at Faulkner University. A life-size statue of him and his father is also at Faulkner University. He was named the Paul Harris Fellow in Rotary International. He was made an honorary Marine by the U.S. Marine Corps. The Texas A&M Class of 57 endowed a medical school scholarship in his honor. He proudly represented Texas in the International Special Olympics. He was featured in the only United Way commercial for the NFL. He received the Alabama Sports Festival medal and was carried on to the, that was carried onto the space shuttle. He kicked off the first down for downs associated with the NFL Arizona Cardinals. He appeared on the Today Show, Dateline, and ABC specials. He was featured in People's Magazine, Reader's Digest, and many other Christian publications. He assisted teaching Sunday school classes for four-year-olds in various churches. One university included him on a special list of five people who have changed the world. He was baptized into Christ in 1985 in Dallas. His name was written down in the Lamb's Book of Life in heaven. And all of that happened because Gene Stallings was his daddy a famous football coach. Who's your father? <laughs> that gives some of us retarded kids uh, a little hope, doesn't it? <laughs> God is our father, and he going to treat us differently. We're talking about sanctification. We're talking about going from point A to point B. We're talking about starting out none of Christ and all of me, some of Christ and some of me, and all of Christ and none of me. That's where we're headed. And the way we get there is not by law. It did not work. Now let me list for you seven things that are advantages you have on the other side of the wall from the synagogue, on the church side. Number one, your new creation. We pointed that out. You have a new heart, new perspective, new energy, new power. In John chapter 7, Jesus said, He that believeth on me, as the scripture saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And this he was said, talking about the Holy Spirit. 
Some of you have been down to Roaring River State Park. Millions and millions of gallons flow out right out of sight of a cliff. Now, you're going to go down there. You don't have to get on the telephone and say, we're bringing a group of high school students down to the park. Would you please have Roaring River flow today? You know, you can't stop it. If you put the Army Corps of Engineers down there and said, well, we want to stop up that river, you can't do it. And when the Holy Spirit gets inside you, the devil can't stop you either. He that believeth on me, as the scripture says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Number two, Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he has promised never to leave you or forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. Don't lose sight of that. I was at the bedside of a dying woman years ago. Her name was Grace Ogden. And I said, Grace, I know you don't feel like a long scripture, but let me quote for you from Hebrews. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. And she finished the verse. For he hath said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Number three, the Corinthians knew this. They had the church. Every living thing has got to have an environment. An orchid can't survive out in Missouri. It's not the right environment. Penguins can't survive. It's the wrong environment. And when you're born again, you've got to have an environment, and you've got to meet regularly. Don't you dare forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhort one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. You may be able to worship God on your tractor or on your fishing boat, but you can't exhort one another there. And you need to do that. Paul said, all are yours. Paul, Apollos, Cephas, things present, things to come, life. They're all yours. And you are Christ and Christ is God's. So it's not just, and I appreciated Jason's remarks, it's not just the word of truth fellowship. My gracious, we're in a worldwide fellowship. You can't go anywhere on the face of this earth, but what God has got somebody there, members of his body, sensitive to his leading, endeavoring to do his will. I got to point out that angels are ministering spirits specially commissioned to help you. Uh, when Jesus was in the wilderness, angels ministered. When he was in the garden of Gethsemane, angels ministered, an angel ministered to him. And he was tempted in all points like as we are. We got a spiritual armor. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wilds of the devil and having done all to stand. God has made provision. You don't have to sin. You don't have to fall away. You can be faithful unto death and he that's begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Number six, you're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Oh, we mentioned Hebrews 12, but I didn't continue. You come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, innumerable company of angels, the spirits of just men made perfect, God the judge of all, Jesus the mediator of a better covenant. And they're all surrounding, they're here. Angels, Paul said, I charge you before God and the elect angel. Women are too appropriately dressed because of the angel. The angels are here. And their purpose Hebrews 1.14, the purpose is to minister to you who are the heirs of salvation. And then Romans 8.28, you know that by heart. <laughs> Everything is working together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. Now, I'm going to ask you to open your Refreshing Waters hymnal to number 96. At the top of the left hand top of the page is the name Edward Mote, M O T E. He lived in Horsham, West Sussex, England. In 1830, 
a bunch of preachers and scholars from Oxford University began what is known as the Oxford Movement. They were concerned about decline in the Anglican Church, and they wrote a bunch of tracts. They started a tract society called Tracts for the Times, and they emphasized apostolic succession, baptismal regeneration, and the importance of rituals in worship. That was what they emphasized. And Edward Moat, perhaps as a reaction against that, wrote this hymn. Let's stand together and sing it as we conclude this session. My hope is built upon nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest strain, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When the darkness fails, his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. When every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His hold is gone. Amen. Yes, let me just say. All right. Have a brief announcement.